Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture for this week on Ancient Greek Theater. Some of this material may be a review for you, especially those who have taken Theater 120, The Heritage of Storytelling, um, but I guarantee you that you do not remember all the vocabulary or the concepts and I will definitely be introducing new material for you. So please keep an open mind and pay attention and I'll be curious to hear what questions and thoughts you have about this lecture once we meet together in class next Wednesday. The time period we are talking about in the uh, late 6th century BC is the Golden Age of Greece, is how it is normally referred to, uh, called such because of the political and social climate that it um, takes place in following a period of disruption and war, which we'll talk about in a moment. This is a map uh, from that time period, so you get a sense of um, the geographical area that we're talking about. You see Athens is the primary place where all of this happened that we're going to be talking about um, here in this little tab of Greece right here. If you've never been, it's an incredible place to visit. Put it on your wish list. For those of you who are theater people, I can tell you that standing at the Theater Dionysus, even though it's in ruins um, below the Acropolis, looking out onto the Mediterranean from the hillside. It's a magical experience connecting you to thousands of years of history that have brought us all to where we stand today as thespians in the 21st century. So one reason that this uh, time period is called the Golden Age of Greece is because it was a time of peace and prosperity that led to cultural advances. Um, the Norton Anthology of Drama introduction to this section says the emergence and rise of Greek theater is intimately tied to the political history of Greece. And this is not unusual throughout cultures that have practiced theater as part of their um, development. It's times of war are bad times to be thriving in terms of culture, right? People don't have the time and luxury to think about their lives and reflect them through media, at least not in this to the same degree and in the same amount as you can during peacetime, time of economic prosperity and stability, political stability, uh, personal stability. So it's not surprising to me that after a long period of war, uh, which is what was happening between what were at the time city-states and Persia, um, that uh, Greece then had a period of prosperity. So Athens, Sparta, and Corinth, and other Greek city-states at the time united together to fight the Persian Wars, which went on for 50 years. 50 years, and uh, Greece became came out victorious. Athens, being a port city and uh, larger than the others, was in an especially strong place after the conflicts had been resolved. Um, and so that is also how it became the cultural and artistic center of the area, um, as well as the kind of idea machine area in terms of science, philosophy, and politics. Um, this is also, of course, where, oh, wait, oh, okay, we're just going to keep going. <laughs> um, this is also, of course, the time at which a new form of government, democracy, influenced the era. Um, democracy, as we know from living in one, although ours is admittedly imperfect as it was in Athens too, I'm sure. Um, democracy promotes individual thought. One person's thoughts or, feel, or beliefs or ways of doing things are not supposed to be superior or exclude anybody else's. Everyone should have an equal voice, um, which enc encourages people to discover, uh, theorize, invent, propose, all of those things. And so that led to major advances in math and science, philosophy, and the arts. Um, that also, for our purposes, is why uh, the say, stage was set, so to speak, to, um, for the development of drama as we know it today. Now, as I said a moment ago, uh, not all democracies are perfect. The Greek, Greeks were certainly not perfect. Um, the people who were encouraged to um, inquire, experiment, think, and expound were all men and, and citizens, specifically, of uh, Athens or Greece, the other city-states. Not slaves, not women. Um, so, you know, an imperfect democracy, but an attempt at equality nonetheless. And that attempt to make opportunities available to more people on a more horizontal rather than hierarchical scale uh, led us to the greatness of this period. So let's move on to talking about the theater itself. 
Theater became part of Greek life uh, much later than things like um, Socrates and his and Plato and their philosophies. Um, it took some time to develop, but um, it's important to understand the origins are religious. They were drama was developed and offered in service to the god of Dionysus um, as a way to honor him. And it's interesting to me that Dionysus is the god of theater, who is also the god of wine, fertility, uh, and agriculture as well. Um, <clears throat> and that suggests to me that theater is not meant to be something calm and rational, although the form that it took is interesting because it's very ordered, uh, very Apollonian as opposed to Dionysian. Um, but it was supposed to excite people, I think, and add to the frenzy of the festivals of which it was a part. So it's interesting, we should be thinking about in what way would this have been um, create ecstasy, perhaps, in the audience, as we talked about in our shaman lecture, um, and in what about the form could incite that. Just something to be thinking about. Um, so let's see, moving on to uh, talk a little bit more about Dionysus and the worship of him. So as I mentioned, Dionysus is the Greek god of wine, fertility, agriculture, and I forgot intoxication, but I guess that goes right along with wine. Um, it, the worship of Dionysus is something that came about gradually. As you may know, Greece was a polytheistic uh, society, and they had a top, whole pantheon, it was called, of gods and their offsprings of the gods, who um, basically ruled life, especially in the mythic past. Um, of that was still very much in the minds and hearts of people in Greece in 6th century BCE. Um, it, let's see, I can't go back, okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, Dionysus is known for his disordering effect on societies, even as his powers are the ones that keep regenerating it. Um, and people who celebrated him or were, were dedicated to him tended to do so in a bit of a frenzy. His followers were known, his female followers were known as maenads, um, and they were known to work themselves up into such a trance that they um, did things like dismember animals with their bare hands, or at least are rumored to have done so. This is actually something that's depicted in the play The Bacchae by Euripides, where the mother of Pentheus mistakes him for a lion when she is in a monadic frenzy and actually tears off his head with her bare hands. That's a bit extreme. That's a bit insightful of ecstasy, perhaps, in the sense, the shamanic sense. Um, so a little bit more about the worship of Dionysus here. Let's see. So as far as we know, although there is always room for error when history is this old and documentation is so scarce, um, the worship of Dionysus included choruses of men who danced and sang things called Dithy Rams, which were songs that recounted the dramatic events in Dionysus's life. They were basically odes to him. People who performed these songs were called trajoidoi. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm not a Greek scholar, but um, this also points to the root of the word of the dramatic form that comes out of this period. The people who sang the dithyrams, the trajoidoi, were dressed like satyrs, which, as Xavier, I believe, pointed out in our class the other day, are half man, half goat figures that are from mythology. And they dressed like them because satyrs were the companions of people, of mythic figures like Dionysus and the god Pan, who's like the god of the forest, kind of, who apparently enjoyed the singing and dancing of the goat men. They are depicted a lot in Greek pottery, as you can see on the image on this slide. So eventually, out of the dithyrams arose the literary drama that will is the subject of our study. It is said to be true that out of the dithyram arose the written drama, and that Thespis, depicted here, was the first to uh, separate, to create drama by separating uh, out of the chorus. So the dithyrams were choruses of people that were all singing pretty and dancing pretty much at the same time. By stepping out of the chorus and speaking with the chorus, Thespis introduces dialogue, conversation between two people, the prefix di, di, meaning two. 
Um, he then was like, oh, I have ideas for stories. So he wrote texts for performance um, and then had the idea to use masks to play multiple characters. So masks must have existed already in some form in Greek culture, perhaps for pantomimes or other more simpler entertainments. Um, but Thespis connected the dots and realized how they could be used in this new form of performance as well. So Thespis is rumored, again, a lot of some of this may be apocryphal. There's some contention over, you know, some of the veracity of these accepted facts, but we're going to go with what we've got. Um, he helped spread the idea of his new performance form by building a portable stage on a cart that he used to tour the city-states of Greece and spread the idea, uh, his ideas around. Interestingly, in the medieval period, we'll see pageant wagons, which are quite similar, even though... Um, not exactly the same, but it is interesting to see how cultures replicate ideas uh, without even knowing about them from each other. Um, interestingly, even though he was an old man by this time, Thespis was the first playwright to win the dramatic competition at the city Dionysia, which is a competition that we'll talk more about now. So all of the texts that we have available to us from ancient Greece um, were written to be presented at the festival of the city Dionysia, which was first, um, which was first inst instituted by King Pesisastros, who was very dedicated to the worship of Dionysus. Plays were chosen 11 months in advance by a group of um, uh, people called the Archon, and who, or by the Archon, an individual who was a government appointed official in charge of doing this kind of thing. Um, the city Dionysia itself was not just about the drama, it was itself a week long celebration in late March or early April in the springtime, which is a time of renewal. And uh, at that time, everybody stopped working. Uh, if a war was being fought, it was temporarily ceased. Some people think that prisoners were released to be allowed to attend the festival and that possibly even women and slaves were allowed to attend to, but it's hard to find concrete evidence of that. It was expected though and required that all citizens of Greece, the, the males who qualified in that category, were expected to attend. Um, dramatic competitions were added to the festival in 534 BCE and performed at the Theater of Dionysus, which again is on the hillside uh, right beneath the Acropolis in Athens. Um, there were three days of competition. Each day, one playwright presented what we call a tetralogy, which was a series of three tragedies followed by a satyr play. Now, a satyr play is a play was a play that was making fun of the themes and content of one of the tragedies in the playwright's trilogy. So it was like the playwright humbling himself by making fun of himself through this funny comedic uh, form. You may notice the um, similarity between the words satyr and satire. There's certainly some connection here um, in the forms. So these uh, festivals were very important to the Athenians and other Greeks, and they're still important to us today. Um, as a textbook I like to use titled Living Theater, the authors point out, festivals remind audiences of the centrality of theater in our lives and of its, of, of, of its ability to establish a sense of community. And community was certainly an important motivating factor of these festivals because people would come from all around just as much as the centrality of the worship of Dionysus was part of the festival. Um, here's a couple, here's a fun fact about spectators at festivals. First of all, there were officials in the theater who carried canes to ensure good order among the spectators, which I thought was interesting, keeping in mind that these people were drinking wine all day long and sitting around watching tragedy all day long, so they needed to blow off some steam, I'm sure, sometimes. Um, also, they used to get a little rowdy and hoot and whistle and drum their heels against their seats whenever they wanted to clear an actor off the stage. We see this in other periods of theater history as well, um, notably in the United States in the 19th century, the audiences were pretty irascible and would um, show their favor or disfavor very vocally then as well. Um, these little tidbits and others in this presentation come from a book I found online in the library called A Cabinet of Greek Curiosity, Strange Tales and Surprising Facts from the Cradle of Western Civilization. Um, your findings in the Bizarre Tales exercise inspired me to do a little search of my own, and this is something that came up in the library catalog. It's available online if you're interested in checking it out. 
Um, at least for the first uh, 50, 60 years of the City Dionysia festivals, the playwrights were the stars. Um, and we, unfortunately, even though hundreds of plays were written in this period, we have only um, the plays from three playwrights, complete plays. There are fragments from others and lines of text recorded in the writings of other people. But we only have a handful of uh, a few what's called extant texts, E-X-T-A-N-T, -T, meaning still surviving, of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. And these are fantastic pieces of literature. It does make me sad to think that there may have been even better ones of their collection, or perhaps worse ones, but we'll never know, because a lot of the transcripts of their plays were burned at the fire of Alexandria, at the Library of Alexandria, destroying so much uh, documentation from this time period, but at least we have what we have. Um, and so it's interesting to know about these people and their contribution to the development of drama. So let's start with Aeschylus. Aeschylus is the oldest of the extant playwrights um, and whose works date back the furthest, I should say. He was of noble birth, um, like our other play, uh, like Sophocles, he's a soldier. And he participated a bit in government and was very well respected in his community. We think he wrote 90 plays and we only have seven of them. His most well known are from his Oresteia trilogy, his play Prometheus Bound, which is really an exceptional play and is the only Greek tragedy without any human characters in it, and Seven Against Thebes, all of which are produced fairly regularly today. Um, he was the first to kind of develop the drama into a separate form from singing, dancing, or storytelling by adding a second actor, and this is allowing true interaction. So Thespis introduced the first actor, but it kept it from being truly theatrical um, because you couldn't develop scene work, right? And Aeschylus, by adding a second actor, exponentially multiplied the possibilities for interactions on stage between just two speaking people rather than a speaking person and the singing chorus. Um, his subject matter was typically noble families and lofty themes. His work was known for the superb lyricism of his poetry, his attention to dramatic structure, and the intellectual content of his work. So he was a thinking playwright and really paid attention to form and tried to match his content to it as, as well as possible. Um, he used the chorus more extensively than our other playwrights. He had the biggest chorus of the three, and they had the most presence in the plays of the three that we'll look at. Um, and in his choral odes, as if, as you know, may know from reading Medea for this class or other Greek plays, um, the most poetic portions of Greek tragedies tend to be in the choral odes as they were almost like hymns. Um, and the imagery and poetry tends to be the most intense there. And he excelled at using the chorus in this way. Um, he, like the others, was a, a poet, a playwright director, and sometimes an actor. This was very common early in the uh, history of the city Dionysia. He really enjoyed spectacle, and so he had thoughts about stage machinery and scenic painting and costumes that helped innovate the presentation of the form. Sophocles would do this as well. Um, a little fun fact I just recently learned. So a little fun fact here about um, how Aeschylus died, or is it fun? I don't know. It's kind of like, I, you can see it as fun because it's a weird tale, and it may or may not have actually happened. Um, so it says here, the unusual nature of Aeschylus' death makes it worth recording. He went outside the walls of the Sicilian city in which he was staying and sat down in a sunny spot. An eagle flying over with a tortoise in its talons mistook his shiny bald head for a stone. It dropped the tortoise on Aeschylus's head so that it could break its shell and eat its flesh. By that blow, the source and beginning of tragedy in its more powerful form was extinguished. Meaning, the kind of grandfather of tragedy had died. Pliny refines this tale by adding that Aeschylus stayed out, in open, stayed out of open places in the hope of cheating a prophecy that he would be killed by a falling object. This tale of Aeschylus's bizarre demise may be inspired by one of his plays. A fragment of the mostly lost Necromancers reads, A heron flying overhead will strike you with, the, with dung, um, excrement, emptied from its belly. Your aged scalp from which the hair has fallen out will be made to fester by a spine from its food gathered in the sea. So basically, <laughs> this says that a bird will crap on your head and poison you with the contents of it. 
which is really bizarre in itself. <laughs> One more um, fact on the next slide. And again, this may be a rumor, but it was said that Sophocles used to criticize Aeschylus for writing his plays while drunk, saying that even though he composes as he should, he does so without being aware of what he's doing. <laughs> Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but there must have been some reason for the rumor. This reminds me of, um, of uh, um, Hemingway, who wrote a lot of, who did a lot of his writing drunk, as well as um, William S. Burroughs. Writers, you know. So now let's talk about Sophocles. You can kind of see pictured in the background of this slide. Like Aeschylus, he was a high, highly respected member of his community. He was a general, a civic leader, an ambassador, and a priest. Um, so did a little bit of everything. He was known for his very tight plot construction. According to Living Theater, he introduces characters and information skillfully and then builds swiftly to a climax. Um, he is known for the exploration and focus on the individual, which helps explain his um, excellent Oedipus plays and the play Antigone as well. Um, he was another person who acted in his plays, like Aeschylus did. He was one of the most popular playwrights. He won the first prize in the city Dionysia 18 times and never finished lower than second. He was highly revered. He was also innovative. Like Aeschylus, he sought ways to make theater even better. He introduced the third actor, which was really significant because the more actors you have, the more characters are possible, and that introduces the more opportunities for interaction and so for conflict. Um, Aristotle, who was also a big fan, also credits him with developments in scene painting, um, which we have lost any visual depictions of, but there has there's a lot of theories out there about him developing um, uh, things that are, you know, the ancestors of modern day flats and things like that. His best known plays are Oedipus the King, Antigone, and Oedipus at Colonus. Um, and interestingly, although they deal with one family, these were not written as a trilogy presented at the festival. They were written at different times and not even in chronological order as parts of different tetralogies. So it's, it's, it's uh, tempting to think of them as a series, but they're not. Uh, fun fact about Sophocles, Sophocles is also said to have died in a remarkable way. The life of Sophocles records that he choked on an unripe grape. He died of joy when told, so there's a, oh, sorry, there's these conflicting messages, right? Um, there, some people say the life of Sophocles records that he choked on an unripe grape. He died of joy when told that his last play had been victorious or reading aloud a long section near the end of his Antigone with no commas or other punctuation that would allow him to pause to take a breath, put too much of a strain on his aged body. So basically they're saying maybe he's died by suffocating uh, while trying to read his own work because of the poor punctuation. I don't know, man, these Greeks, they are pretty critical of each other. Okay, and finally, uh, we come to our last extant playwright, Euripides. Um, Euripides is considered kind of the rebel, the bad boy. Um, he was considered the most modern of his uh, companions because his plays were relatively progressive. They treated women characters more sympathetically, although he himself is rumored to have not liked women. Um, plays tended to be more realistic than the others, meaning maybe perhaps um, in their dialogue or in the uh, less rigidly structured nature. He mixed tragedy with melodrama and comedy from time to time, and he was sometimes skeptical of the gods. Um, some of his audience didn't like that some of his characters behaved like real life people. They wanted people to be larger than life. Um, he was also criticized for having weak plots and including sensational subject matter, as we'll see in the Medea play today or this week. Um, they, he also reduced the chorus a lot, and people didn't like that. Although apparently he was super popular in Sicily for some reason. Um, reading the Strange Tales book, it said something like um, people from Sicily would like just wait and wait and wait to get um, written copies of his poetry and they thought it was so valuable and there's even a rumor of a slave who said he was freed because he um, recited the poetry of Euripides to his master and was then given release so there was some people who put a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, who gave Euripides a lot of credit let's 
see what else about Euripides. Um, the most controversial uh, element of Euripides' plays was his portrayal of the gods as human and fallible, meaning uh, prone to making mistakes, a treatment that was said to undermine the traditional moral order, living theater. Um, ask yourself, how is this true in Medea? In what way is he showing the gods to be less than, um, less than perfect, less than admirable? We'll talk about that in class. So because he wasn't the most mm, true to form playwright, he did not win the prize as often as he as his other predecessors, but uh, he has become more popular since he died. And 18 plays of his exist and more than which is more than any of the other two. Um, he's especially known for Medea and the Buckeye. If you have not read the Buckeye, it is a fabulous play. I wish it was in our anthology. Um, it really should be, but Medea is also fantastic as well. It gives us plenty to talk about, and I look forward to exploring that play with you. So just like with the other playwrights, I found a couple fun facts, and I'll share them on the next slide. So according to legend, Euripides was returning from dinner when King Archelaus of Macedon, whom when he was... Uh, wait, so Euripides was returning from dinner with King Archelaus of Macedon when he was torn to pieces by dogs set on him by some jealous rival. This is interesting, because like... Aeschylus, he's rumored to have died in a way that was also depicted as a method of death in one of his plays. In uh, the Bacchae, one of the plays in Euripides' final trilogy, Pentheus is torn apart by his female kinsfolk, which I mentioned earlier. So whether he actually died that way or not, it's interesting that people are creating these, um, these legends of death that are connected to the playwright's body of work. Also, Euripides is said to have had a very strong dislike for almost all women, either from an innate aversion to their company or because he had two wives at the same time. The Athenians had passed a decree making, the legal, making that legal because of the high number of casualties in the Peloponnesian War, and, has, and he was thoroughly put off by his marriage to them. <laughs> Although, you know, honestly, your, misogyny was not remarkable in this time. The fact that he didn't prefer female company or didn't even like it would not have been that unusual, but maybe he was particularly vociferous about it. Oh, those Greeks. All right, so that was enough enough about the biographies of the playwrights. It's interesting to, to know about them as people and to hear what they contributed individually. Um, but let's talk generally about Greek theater in production, um, most specifically the tragedies, because that's what we have the most information about. We'll start by looking at the buildings themselves. So the theaters, um, or the theatron, uh, also which means seeing place, were the structures in which the plays were taken place and were central to the observance of the city Dionysia. People would gather there at dawn and leave at dusk and watch plays all day long and drink wine all day long. The plays were designed, or excuse me, the theatron was designed very specifically. First it had a uh, orchestra, which is this circular pit down here, literally the dancing place, the stage as we know it today. Uh, this is where the choral dances take place and a lot of the character interactions. Then we have the parados, which are the aisles on the sides that were used for the uh, elaborate entrances and exits of the chorus here, down here. There may have also been some um, through the house, depends on the space. Then there's the timely, which is this little um, symbol in the center of the orchestra. Altar is an altar in the middle of the orchestra. The actors would use it as a place to keep themselves hidden so they could seem to suddenly appear in a scene. But the centrality of the family in the middle of the performance space also is a reminder of how um, central religious worship was to the construction and purpose of the theaters. Then we have the skene, which is the wooden structure behind the orchestra here where actors changed masks or costumes and through, and through doors in the structure made entrances or exits. So while the chorus is coming here on the sides, the actors are coming in from behind. This is often uh, supposed to be a, uh, the palace or some other central cityscape um, location. And when it was time to become another actor, another character, the actors would come back here, change their mask or, and or costume, and then reemerge from here as well. It's possible there was more flexible blocking and things like that using the rest of the space, but we don't really know that. So those are the essential features. Um, and of course we have the amphitheater portion, which is where the audience would sit. We call that the house today. 
So other little tidbits about um, ancient Greek theater and production. Um, there's always got to ask yourself, where does the money come from for theater? And that can tell you a lot about a society and, and the centrality of art in it. Um, so they kind of split the cost between private citizens and the government. Folks known as Koregos were individual citizens who paid the members of the chorus uh, for a playwright. And they took this very seriously. It was, a, it was a mark of pride to be able to do this. And if your um, plays won the competition, then you also got to share in that glory. The government paid for actors and the playwright. So there was, like I say, a split um, in how these expenses were paid. Playwrights um, ran the rehearsals, sometimes also acted in their plays. They were very, very active in the production of their own work, at least in the beginning. Um, only citizens were allowed to be actors or to be in the chorus, um, and a citizens being a very limited group of people. <laughs> Um, we'll talk more about actors in a little bit. So even though spectacle was not what we would recognize it as today, um, there was a lot of visual and decorative elements to Greek tragedy in addition to the language. So actors were known to wear large full face masks. I'm sure you've seen many images of them over time. And their costumes were bulky and elaborate tunics. Um, they're also said to have used these platform boots called kathornoi, which may not have been used in um, the golden age of Greece, but definitely seem to have been used in the Hellenistic age, which, which followed. The ekaklema was an interesting stage machinery thing. Um, it was used to enhance reveals. Um, it was a rolling platform, kind of like a wheelbarrow maybe, or a bit of a wagon often used to display dead bodies. And this is because a lot of the violence in Greek tragedies, or almost all of it, all of it happens off stage. They thought it was too um, salacious to show violence on stage. It wasn't part of the storytelling. The fact of the violence was part of the plot, not the depiction of the violence itself. This would change with the Romans. The Romans who adapted a lot of Greek tragedies, which they learned from, learned about from their Greek slaves, added a lot of scenes of violence, Seneca being a very um, famous playwright in that style. Uh, let's see, where are we at? Okay, so we have the Echoclema, and then of course another aspect of Greek tragic spectacle, the things that made these stage effects possible, was the mechane, um, a crane used to move characters through the air. The term deus ex machina, as you may already know, derives from Greek, the Greek use of a crane to introduce gods into a play who neatly resolved the action when it seemed that no other method could do so. It literally means god from a machine, deus ex machina. So an actor playing a god would be hooked up to this crane and they would fly him up and over the action and he would descend on into the, into the action and talk to the characters in the play and say you do this and you do this and you do this and that solves everyone's problems so it's like now we use the term kind of generally to refer to whenever there's kind of a an unrealistic or a sudden or extra convenient resolution to a complicated plot we call it a deus ex machina and it's still used every once in a while um, either intentionally or as a last resort by playwrights we're going to talk a little bit about the tragic the tragedies themselves as literature um, the form that they take and their content. And then we'll move on to um, talking about actors and acting style. And that's, that's gonna wrap us up for this presentation. So two more topics here, hang in there with me. So as a general rule, Greek tragedies resemble what we know as climactic drama. You might also know this as linear plot development. And this is uh, plays that, um, have a late point of attack, meaning that the action begins near or at the point of crisis, and that has characters already enmeshed in their struggles. So it's not really about um, this long story about what happens that leads up to a climax. It's like, okay, where are we in the story and how close are we to what the, the meat of the dramatic action, the climax and the resolution, because it is the climax and what the consequences of what happens afterwards that is the most interesting uh, to Greek audiences at this time. So this requires that the audience be given a lot of exposition. They need to know a lot of information about what's already happened before they can understand the late part of the story that they're coming in, in on. 
Um, the action and the plot are linear. There's very much a cause and effect development. Event A leads to event B, leads to event C, until we have the climax, right? Um, dramatic tension stems from constant calamity, meaning bad events. It peaks in the scene of suffering, which is when anagnorisis and peripatia are likely to occur. So these are terms you may remember from 120 or other introductory theater courses. If not, here's a little review. So anagnorisis is when a protagonist recognizes something crucial that changes everything. I always remember these by the fact that recognition and the word anagnorisis both have a G in them. So anagnorisis, recognition, that helps me remember. Peripatia is a reversal of fortune. And if it helps you to remember the word this is um, peripatetic is when somebody is going back and forth about something, um, if that helps you to remember. Sometimes a reversal of fortune leads to a recognition, and sometimes a recognition leads to a re reversal of fortune, although they don't have to both be present. Um, either of which, though, can contribute to what's called the scene of suffering, the scene in which we see the character fully take in the reality, the extent to which their suffering is happening, to which they've caused their own suffering a lot of the time, and um, the outcome of the recognition or the peripatia. So um, this linear form, this climactic form that is, you know, all about um, calamities leading characters to crises that have to resolve in some way or another is very familiar and we see it throughout history uh, and it, it most um, present in the form of melodrama, but also in realism too, to a certain extent. So here's just a quick diagram that lets you kind of see the shape of climactic drama. It starts with some kind of exposition or opening, the information we need to know to understand the given circumstances, and then conflict is introduced. There's some kind of inciting incident, an important thing that starts the dominoes all falling over. From the inciting incident, we have the rising action, event A leading to event B to event C, and things rise in tension and um, suspense until we get to the climax. The climax is the point at which something has to happen because things have gotten to a point where we, something has to give. A decision has to be made, a sacrifice perhaps, a change, a choice, travel, a murder, <laughs> revenge, something. And the choice is made and the consequences of that choice or, that, um, or the events that led forced action lead to the falling action. <coughs> Excuse me. Also called the denouement in French, if you like to be fancy. Um, and this is the outcome of the climax. And finally, the resolution is how things are just kind of wrapping up for the people in the play. Happily, unhappily, somewhere in between. Uh, but we come to some kind of ending. So in addition to the plot structure being fairly standard in Greek tragedies, there's also um, some other conventions that are consistent across the form. So for example, almost all tragedies are based in a mythic past populated by gods, demigods, and heroes. And when I say a mythic past, I mean uh, a mythic past to the Athenians of ancient Greece. These are their uh, origin stories, the mythology that circulated in their culture to help them understand their present day circumstances uh, and their theological traditions. Um, so what's interesting about that is that the audience came to see plays already knowing the stories of the characters that were in them. Um, this means there was no, really not a lot of suspense involved unless the plot was very particularly instructed, uh, excuse me, constructed. Um, and the audience was interested in how the playwright would interpret the story, how they would use their writing skills to create, con to create compelling poetry, um, and how they would arrange the events to be exciting or unusual, and how the actors, of course, would interpret the characters. Um, so it's very different than what we experience today, where we expect each playwright to present us with their own unique story. So they had a collective well of stories and the competitions were about how well could you reimagine them for that day's audience. Um, it's also because of their basis in re religion, worship and ritual. Um, the plays themselves are very highly structured beyond the plot structure. So for example, they tend to begin with a prologos or as we call it prologue or, and or, a uh, parados, the procession of the chorus into the acting space. So there's this like in initiative event is part of the dramaturgy. They contain episodes or episodia where main characters speak to one another or the chorus make up 
uh, they speak to one another or they speak to the chorus, and these episodes make up the primary body of the play. And then we have stasima, which are choral songs without dialogue. Uh, we wouldn't have these recorded in our texts. Um, maybe this is chanting or some kind of vocalization, but it's part of the presentation of the tragic plays. And finally, at the end of the play, um, when the characters leave, it's an exodus or exodus um, as a firm of the word that we use today. The chorus leaves the space through the parados uh, of the theater. Let's see. <clears throat> and I've mentioned the scene of suffering before, which is definitely uh, actually should probably still be in this section here as well. It's part of the um, uh, general inevitable outcome is a scene of suffering leading to the falling action and the and the resolution. So just a quick note on the tragic heroes and heroines that populate the texts of these plays. Generally, uh, the protagonists, the um, instigator and the main agent of the action of these tragedies are people of royal birth or other very high social standing and sometimes the gods. They, the tragedy is that they are in an elevated place in society, um, but they're, through their own actions, they're brought low and brought to places of suffering and loss through their own folly. Aristotle has an opinion about this. He says, the reason that people of high uh, standing or birth make good subjects for tragedies is that it is hard to see someone who is so high brought so low. If someone is already low social standing and they have suffer loss or folly, it's less tragic. You may or may not agree with that, but that was what he was thinking there. We'll talk more about, <clears throat> excuse me, the people in Greek tragedies and what Aristotle thought was appropriate for representing in this genre when we get to his work next week. So I want to finish up with just some fun information about actors in ancient Greece. There isn't a whole ton that is known about them, but I was able to dig up some information. So uh, a funny quote from the Cabinet of Greek Curiosities. If you strip a tragic actor of his mask and his gold embroidered robe, all that is left is a funny little man hired for seven drachmas to perform at the festival. <laughs> this man, Lucian Icarenibus, um, said this, and I don't know if this was a shared sentiment, but I thought it was pretty funny. Um, we'll talk more about how uh, the profession of acting on the next slide. So at the beginning of the festivals, um, when things were just getting started, playwrights were likely to perform in their own plays and to be the ones to select the other actors to round out the cast. As the uh, competitions got more popular and more competitive, um, and the actors became more skilled, the state took over the responsibility of appointing actors for each play because they didn't want the playwrights uh, to have unfair advantage taking the best actors. So they made sure that the skilled actors were, uh, or at least theoretically, they made sure that the skilled actors were distributed evenly across the um, pool of actors for the plays in the festival. Um, it was rare at this time for someone to have a career solely as an actor. There just wasn't enough opportunity and it probably didn't pay that well, but part-time was definitely possible. And um, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about um, how serious people got about it in a second here. So um, as was true in many company um, hierarchies or formation, organizational styles throughout history, there was a hierarchy among the actors in ancient Greece. We see this again in the Restoration period in Shakespeare's day, in other times in the neoclassical period where um, different actors were deemed to be kind of more important or with more clout and so would get paid more and get better parts. And that was uh, very true here in ancient Greece. So the top of the food chain of the actor hierarchy was the protagonist, and um, this was appointed by state officials. These actors played the major roles like Oedipus, Antigone, Medea, um, and only um, they were the only ones who were able to win prizes for their performances, and which started in being introduced into festivals in 449 BC. They could be very egotistical about the superior position in the actor hierarchy, um, some actors would not allow others to enter before them, for example, even if it made sense for them to do so. The middle of our uh, trilogy of actors in this hierarchy is what's called the deuterogenist, um, and they would play the more minor roles like Ismene or perhaps Jocasta, maybe even Tiresias. And finally, we have the tritagonist, who was the bottom of the totem pole here, 
um, and assign the parts that were kind of evil villains, tyrants and monarchs, and also they would be responsible for speaking the prologue. So this might be someone who played Creon, for example, in Antigone. Um, maybe Jason in Medea? And when it comes to acting style, knowing what you know about the size and scope of not only the playing spaces, but of the content of the tragedies, you might guess that the acting style in ancient Greece was big. <laughs> um, large, elegant gestures were prized. Um, from this excellent book I have called Actors on Acting, the authors say, given their rather burdensome costume and mask, we can assume that the expressiveness of the actor dependent dependent in part on full body postures and articulate hand movements. So making your body large, keeping your gestures very clean would be very important. Uh, you'll get a chance to feel what this might have felt like when we go to the open air amphitheater. They also, and almost more importantly, needed expressive, well-trained voices. Not only did they need to fill the space, a massive space, and be articulate in their delivery of poetry, um, their audience was also very unforgiving. It says, Greek audiences accustomed to music, musical and poetic performances in their religious ceremonies were critical and exacting. So as we saw earlier, they could boo someone off stage. So I imagine that poor oratorical skills or poor um, vocalization, vocal qualities, diction, things like that would get you ousted as well. And finally, one little fun fact about actors. <laughs> Just like actors today, they unionized. Um, they created the Artists of Dionysus, and it was generally headed by a protagonist actor. So in our modern day parlance, this is SAG-AFTRA and Fran, Dres Fran Drescher is the one in charge. Um, and of course, they are striking right now. The people in this union secured rights for uh, actors such as exemptions for military service and the right to travel at will during wartime so they could um, still do their profession even if other folks, more, other citizens were restricted from travel. That's all I have for you today on Greek theater. Next time we'll be talking about Aristotle's view of tragedy um, from his very famous book, The Poetics, and we'll discuss in what ways his works from 2,500 years ago are still influencing how we understand and, and uh, interpret dramatic form. Um, we'll also, of course, be diving into Medea in our class and uh, moving on to Greek comedy and Lysistrata. I believe we'll also be reading from the theater and ethics book as part of this unit. A lot of information to take in, so make sure you're keeping up. I look forward to hearing your questions and thoughts about this lecture in our class discussion. Please come ready with your notes um, because we will be reviewing important concepts as well and it's a good opportunity to see what you're retaining in preparation for our midterm. Never, never too early to start getting on top of that. Enjoy your holiday weekend. I'll see you next week at the Cal Coast Amphitheater.